Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a collaboration among the Columbia Alumni Association Columbia at Home series, Columbia Magazine, and GSAS Conversations. I am Erin Hussein. I am a 1992 alum of Columbia College and a 95 alum of the law school, and I'm currently Associate Director of Alumni Relations for the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. We introduced, we reintroduced the GSAS Conversations series in virtual form in 2020 to help us escape our homes and home offices with the guidance of a GSAS alumni who led us through Wall Street, medieval Europe, the press room of the White House, urban centers, the new JFK Terminal One, the vineyards of Italy, the World Series of Poker, schools impacted by COVID in India and the Middle East. We explored the ways in which statistics can inform discussions of inequality and today, we have been asked to consider what we would do if we could know how long we have to live. I am pleased to welcome best-selling author Nikki Ehrlich, a 2017 graduate of Columbia's master's program in global thought for this lunchtime chat about her novel, The Measure. For the next hour, Rebecca Shapiro, managing editor of Columbia Magazine and Nikki will explore the ways the inhabitants of the world that Nikki built wrestle with their decisions and the aftermath. After the presentation, we'll take audience questions. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many as we can in the time allowed. I'm now pleased to welcome Nikki Ehrlich and Rebecca Shapiro. Uh, great, thanks so much, Erin. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself quickly. My name is Rebecca Shapiro. I'm the managing editor of Columbia Magazine and also edit the book section. Um, and I was very privileged to be able to review Nikki's book for our fall issue, which just hit mailboxes. Um, and so I just wanted to say thanks first to Nikki for joining us. I'm really excited to dive into some things about your book. Um, and thanks to the audience uh, for joining us on this rainy and, and gloomy <laughs> fall day. Um, we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts again after the, the our conversation. And as Erin said, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to submit your questions. Um, so I uh, just uh, wanted to dive in quickly. Um, Nikki, like I said, I had such a fun time reading your book. Um, my copy is completely dog-eared because I found it so thought-provoking. Um, and I really am interested in hearing more from you about it um, and wanted to start kind of, it's such a conceptual book. Uh, mm -hmm. So I wanted to know kind of how the idea came to you, whether it was something that you kind of long been mulling over or whether you had a spark and something kind of yes. uh, put in your head. Yeah, so for, for those who haven't read it, um, the main kind of part of the concept is that um, one day overnight, billions of um, mysterious boxes appear um, on the doorsteps outside every adult's home all around the world. Um, and, and every box looks the same, um, except it has the name of the recipient on it. And every box has the same kind of cryptic inscription on it, which says, the measure of your life lies within. And um, for those who open the box, within the box is a single piece of string and it's um, because these boxes have arrived all over the world for everybody, um, countries are able to kind of quickly collaborate and realize that the measure of the length of string inside each person's box actually equates with the full length of their life. And so then the, the main um, you know, problem confronting all the characters is that they have to decide if they want to open this box and measure this string and kind of accept this knowledge and, and choose what to do with this knowledge. And so um, for me, I think the, the concept was kind of an evolution of ideas, um, mostly that I've just always been someone, um, I think like all of us who struggles a little bit with how kind of unpredictable life feels, and how random it can feel sometimes, um, especially during times like these last several years where it feels like really, you know, do we have any control at all? Or is the world just kind of spiraling outside my window and I don't have any power over it? Um, and so I wanted to see if I could kind of tackle these ideas in a story, a story about, you know, how much control we have, how much power we have over our fate. And that got me thinking about the concept of fate, which is very big. I didn't know how I could kind of tackle it in a book um, until I remembered the ancient Greek mythology around fate and their belief, particularly in um, the three fates who are sort of these three, um, you know, all powerful goddess figures who would weave these strings of life on their spindles and kind of measure the amount of time that all, you know, mortals down below would receive. 
And um, the light bulb moment was kind of, what if these strings were real? And what if we could see them somehow and, and use them? Um, you know, how would we use them as, as individuals, as a society? Um, and I decided to sort of combine that with another famous Greek myth that, you know, everybody knows and loves of um, Pandora's box. And so I thought I'll put, I'll put a string inside of Pandora's box sort of for each person. And then the question is, you know, do you have the willpower to resist the curiosity of looking? Um, and that's, and then the rest of the story kind of un unfolded after that, but that though, that was the sort of initial, initial moment. Super interesting. Um, I, I wonder, uh, have you long been a fiction writer? Um, and was that something that you were kind of like looking for an idea for a novel uh, or when you started thinking more about fate, it felt like it belonged more in fiction? Mm. Yeah, I, I've always been a huge fiction reader um, ever since I was really, really young, just always been surrounded by books. Um, and truly like writing my own novel is just this dream that, I, that I've always had. I can't remember not having it um, and not having this be kind of what I wanted to do with my life. And so I did write some, some short stories, some poetry in school, um, but then ended up pursuing um, journalism after graduating Columbia. And this was really my first attempt at actually writing a full length manuscript. So I'm, uh, I'm very, very lucky that it actually kind of you know, came to fruition uh, as a book. Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing. Um, and I'm curious. Um, I I know you studied in the in Columbia somewhat innovative and new uh, global thought program, uh, which I assume does not graduate many fiction writers. Um, I'm just curious a little bit about your background and what drew you know kind of what uh, drew you to that program, and then how that sort of informed uh, your thought process when you were thinking about um, how to shape your novel. Yeah, um, I had studied uh, comparative literature in undergrad, and so was. Um, obviously doing a lot of reading and writing um, and in, in different languages and was looking into to graduate programs and heard about this brand new program at Columbia. It was only, I think, in its first year at the time that I applied, so I would be in the second year, um, which was really exciting to me um, because Columbia obviously is, you know, has a very, very long history. Um, and so I, I knew that it was a well-established institution, e even though this, um, you know, program was brand new. And um, it was looking for people who were kind of interested in studying things from this global perspective, which is what I had been doing with, you know, with comparative literature in studying kind of global literature. And, um, but I, of course, I didn't know too much about the program until I got there. And it was amazing. It really um, allowed me to explore, kind of to craft my own program, which was, you know, all, all the students there were really crafting their own program. We were studying kind of globalization and global interconnectedness from you know, from different ways. And so some people were more politically focused, some people more economically focused. I was more kind of culturally focused um, and got to take some classes at the Columbia Journalism School, the Columbia School of the Arts to kind of tie in my, my literary and, and writing interests. Um, but I think it, it did really fuel part of the writing of this book in the sense that when I started writing, I thought it would just be, you know, focused on a couple of characters and a slightly kind of smaller story, maybe just a love story between two people. But the more that I kept writing kind of the global thought um, training in my head was going off and thinking, you know, I can't ignore the kind of larger political ramifications, the larger international ramifications um, of this concept of, you know, everybody possibly knowing how long they're going to live. And I wanted to sort of use the book to show how our world is so connected now. Um, you know, countries are collaborating at various parts of the book. There are sort of social movements that jump between continents the way very much, um, you know, that we have in our real world right now. And so this book to me is also kind of about the sort of interconnectedness of the world and, and all people, um, which was something that we studied a lot in the program. Yeah, that 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 sort of ties in perfectly to my next question, which is, uh, <laughs> as I said in my review, like I thought the thing that made your book stand out so much to me, and because the idea of of destiny or fate, as you said, is is a is a long standing tradition in storytelling. Um, it's not a new idea. What I yeah. thought was very new and fresh about your book was the global look at it um, and the way that you thought not just about individual implications, uh, but about societal implications, which honestly is something that never crossed my mind and I think doesn't cross most people's minds when they think about destiny. Um, and I wondered, uh, it's sort of mind boggling, even just at, in the first chapter of your book, when you're describing the boxes landing on people's doorsteps, and it's like, just mind boggling to even comprehend them landing on ev on some on one thing happening to everybody in the world, whether you're in the Sahara, whether you're in New York City, whether you're in Antarctica. Um, and 
and I both wanted to talk just to flesh out a little bit more about why that fascinated you so much. And then to get sort of specifically into uh, something that I, I kept dog-earing pages because I felt like you kept getting at things that of course this would impact, but that hadn't occurred to me because I think people are so in their own personal lives. Um, so I, I thought the way that you dealt with politics was really deft and the way that you dealt with the military was really deft. Um, and I kind of just wanted to, to get into your head a little bit about um, that decision to make it a, a worldwide uh, phenomenon and then how that sort of snowballed in your head to deal to tackle some of those issues. Yeah, I think a lot of it came out of the, the moment that I was writing, which was really the onset of the pandemic. Um, I had I had started the book beforehand. I had this idea about the strings and the boxes beforehand and was working on it kind of in 2019. Um, but it it wasn't moving along as quickly as I wanted to. Obviously I was working you know full time uh, you know and sort of balancing both things, but then um, March, 2020 happened all of a sudden, you know, I'm in quarantine at home. Um, I got laid off from my job because I was working in the travel industry as a travel writer, which was you know, <laughs> yeah. imme immediately decimated. Yeah. Um, and so within a week, I just, you know, ha had nothing. I felt like I was sort of trapped in my home as we all were, um, unemployed for the first time in my life without any sort of structure and grounding. Um, and, realized that this book that I had been writing about this completely unexpected phenomenon suddenly striking the whole world was actually kind of playing out um, in the world that we were living in um, and felt like I couldn't ignore these kind of parallels that were happening and the way that I watched this affect the entire world and the way that it, you know, it, it was something that everyone felt individually and personally in terms of, you know, your own time in isolation, your own fears and anxieties and, and, what was happening to your loved ones at the time, but it was an extremely universal experience too, um, and had these major societal implications. And so I think that inspired me to realize, um, you know, could I replicate that with this book as well too, and kind of explore um, the fact that, you know, with the pandemic, something that wasn't inherently political quickly became politicized. Um, and the same thing with this book, these boxes and strings are not inherently you know, political entities, um, but they become politicized in the book because that was exactly what I was witnessing in the world. And so I think a lot of it was really this, um, you know, this reflection on everything happening um, just right outside my window as I was writing. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's so smart. I mean, because in a sense, it's it was a, it's a little bit like an allegory about the pandemic, but it's not. Um, it's it's totally different, but it is applicable in in that exact way that you bring up. Um, I I thought it was fantastic. For example, like that you said it during an election, which of course was happening during the pandemic also. Um, and of course that would be a, an issue if this were to happen, that candidates would be asking other candidates to reveal their strings. And um, <laughs> it just seemed like a perfect mirror um, to some things that were happening. I thought that was really interesting. Do you think the fact that you were, I mean, obviously this is your first novel, so I guess you don't entirely have anything to compare it to, but uh, do you think the process of writing during quarantine uh, was different than it, uh, how do you think that sort of impacted your yeah. process as a writer? Yeah, I think um, for me, that felt like a time, I'm sure for everybody too, um, that felt like a time where I had very little sense of control in my life. Um, you know, I felt like I couldn't affect meaningful change in terms of what was going on in the world and all the tragedy. Um, and also kind of, you know, having lost my job and the first time not being kind of surrounded by the structure of either school or, or work. Um, I felt like, again, I didn't have anything and that was kind of keeping me grounded there. And so for me, the book was like the main place that I felt a source of kind of power in my life and a source of like, this is something I actually am kind of in, in charge of and do have control over. Um, and I also surprisingly kind of found it a very um, comforting experience to write this book during a time that was um, very, very difficult. And because it, it is a book with um, a lot of characters, there's like eight main perspectives that we jump in and out of. Um, and that was always going to be the case, I think, but um, it, it's sort of, I'm spending so much time with all these different characters and then their lives are kind of interweaving and, and we do see the ways that their lives overlap and touch each other. And so for me, writing in a time of just complete isolation and um, you know social distancing, writing a book about kind of humanity's lives interconnecting was like really, was really comforting, this nice reminder that, um, like no matter how lonely we are, no matter how isolated we are at times, there is something fundamentally that, you know, links us all as humans and we are, um, 
our lives do touch each other's lives, even if we don't kind of see it happening in that moment. Yeah, absolutely. I thought one of the uh, very touching thing in the book was, or a touching device that you used was the um, the support group. Um, and I liked the idea of, of people coming together sort of in person and, uh, and being together. And so I can understand how that was born out of the pandemic when that was yeah. something that we weren't able to do. Um, yeah. And sort of to process something incomprehensible and new together in a way that we were not able to during the pandemic. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I found was interesting was that uh, your characters had some idea of what their destiny would be, but uh, they didn't have like an exact date or a, a ruler or a, a measuring stick. Um, and and I did like uh, how as the book went on, uh, it became there were you know measuring devices popped up on the internet so that you could, which of course would happen in real life, um, so that you could have a better sense. But I was curious about um, why you chose to make it sort of not specific so that um, I guess there's varying degrees that people could mm -hmm. kind of confront their destiny. Like you could go on the internet and measure it to have a certain idea, but rather than saying, you know, in the box, there would be a, a specific date that you were going right. to issue or a calendar or something like that. Yeah. Um, I think the first thought was just, it's, it'll be logistical that like, um, you know, that the first round of technology or something won't be able to be that precise and that only over time will they be able to become more and more precise um just as the way that i just kind of assume the technology would work that this um you know sort of the way we dealt with the pandemic that at first we were like we don't know what we're doing we're testing a bunch of different medications you know obviously we're developing vaccines it'll take time so the fact that just when something unexpected and mysterious kind of strikes the world it takes a lot of time to kind of work things out um and so I wanted that to be a process over the course of the book. Um, but I also think that I wanted the characters to still feel like they had a little bit of a sense of kind of power and control over their fate. Um, and so I felt like if there was an exact date, an exact minute, it would just somehow feel a little different than knowing like I have 20 years. And so I can do whatever I want with these 20 years and I don't know where I'll be during that 20th year. I don't know what my life, you know, and but I can kind of, do what I want to that time. And something about kind of having the exactitude of, of a specific moment, I felt like just took away a little bit of a sense of kind of freedom for the characters. Um, right, you're just living you know. with that hanging over your head forever. Yeah. In even more of a real way than you are with yes. a string, I guess. Yes, yeah. and I also wanted like these strings to be a little bit of a parallel to real life in the sense that, um, you know, we all have a string, um, we don't know, we don't know what it is. We don't know when it ends, but it is there. Um, and so in this book, it's just like this thing, this concept of our mortality that does exist for all of us, even if we don't want to think about it, um, is just actually physically present for these characters um, in the form of this box and this string. And so you can't kind of shove it out of your um, mind or sight, or you can, I mean, some people do like, you know, throw it into a river and never look at it again. Um, but it's just like this kind of concept of our mortality that we all have um, <laughs> is just like physically present for these people. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and that's a great lead into my next question, um, it, it, which is something that I found interesting. Uh, there's a problem with uh, prophecies, I think, with destiny, um, which is that if you know something about your future, you can alter to the decisions that you make um, before that comes true. Um, and and in some sense, then that could alter the prophecy. And, and it's right. it's the same problem that happens with time travel, right? Where yeah. if, if you know what's gonna happen, you can change the way you behave. Um, and then that could make that uh, prophecy come be false. Yeah. Um, and in your book, like I know uh, that some people with short strings immediately like went to seek medical attention, for example, uh, would try to get like full body checkups to know what's going on. Um, I guess I wonder how you kind of dealt with that problem in your head and in the book. Um, yeah if the strings are absolute, then there's essentially nothing that you can do with your life to right. to make a decision that would change the course of your life. Um, and I, I just yeah. wonder how you thought that. And yeah, uh, yeah. And it was it was definitely one of the, once I had this concept, one of the earliest questions I had was, should you be able to change your string? Like, should the act of mm -hmm. seeing your string somehow be able to change it? Um, and I think I decided fairly early on that I, I didn't want that to be the case because I I didn't want it to be a situation where maybe you see that you have a short string and you decide, well, now I'm going to be a really, really good person and just put good karma out into the world and 
maybe I'll be rewarded by my stream becoming longer or something like that, because um, that's just to me is not a realistic way of thinking. Unfortunately, that's not how our world works. Um, you know, bad things happen to good people. Um, and there, there is not necessarily a clear sense of kind of rewards um, for our behavior in, in life. And so I didn't want that to be a line of thinking for people. Um, and for me, it was that the strings do kind of have this sense of kind of omnipotent knowledge in the sense that um, there is a way that the, the, the end of the string takes into consideration everything that you do after having seen, seen your string. It somehow kind of knows your response to it. Um, and so it can't be changed. It's take, it's taking into account the way that you would react. Um, but I do think that, you know, the way a person's string ends, so what ultimately ends a person's life is not determined. Um, and for some of these characters, the way they react to the string, you know, for some people who choose, you know, who choose violence, um, as a way of kind of getting, you know, working through their emotions, um, their string wasn't necessarily going to end in a violent way if they hadn't chosen that violence, um, even though it was going to end at the same moment, if that makes sense. Um, and so for me, it's that, you know, the moment of the string ending has already been determined, but everything up until that moment and including the way that moment plays out um, is still kind of up, up for the characters to, to create for themselves. Right, which, uh, which, uh, which brings me to something else I wanted to talk about, which is sort of how more, morality relates or how your moral compass relates to your string. Um, so for example, you know, in the case of mass shootings, which I thought you dealt with very well, um, there's two characters with short strings. One chooses to use that, you know, one becomes angry about that and, mm -hmm. and disillusioned um, and chooses to, you know, do something violent, whereas and then mm -hmm. somebody else kind of comes in and, and sacrifices himself in a sense, knowing yeah. that his string is short. And it sort of seems in that way that the strings uh, don't dictate someone's behavior in your book, but sort of amplify that the behavior yeah. that they already had within them. Uh, is that how you thought about it? Yes, I think definitely. Um, and I mean, particularly, you know, incorporating some moments of the vi of violence in the book was, um, it, wa it was difficult for me. I, you know, I'm very sensitive to these issues and, and never want to kind of have violence for the just like gratuitous violence um, in a book. But I think wanting this to feel like an accurate, you know, authentic reflection of our reality, I felt like there had, there unfortunately had to be some of that in the book um, because that is the world we live in now. Um, but I do feel like to me, it, it was similar to the pandemic in the sense that, you know, the sort of the virus coming and, and affecting everybody brought out both our kind of worst traits in humanity and our best traits in humanity. Um, you know, it brought out uh, our kind of most selfish impulses to sort of put ourselves above other people. Um, but it also brought out, you know, healthcare workers and teachers and frontline workers really kind of showcasing the very best in us and, and, you know, putting their lives on the line for their communities. And so I felt like I was watching really, you know, the best and worst of, of human impulses on display. And so I felt like really that would happen in this book too, that these strings could have this power to bring out both, um, you know, our, our violent, angry tendencies, as well as our, um, you know, sense of, of community and, and morality and um, kind of show this sort of duality in, in people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess, uh, so So your book obviously deals with big societal issues, but there are characters that you get, you know, there are, there are characters' lives that you get very invested in. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about how you kind of thought about some of your characters um, and how you came up with some of the circumstances yeah. that they were in and, you know, sort of whether you relate to any of them in particular. <laughs> um, yeah, everyone always, always ask which which character is you, which I guess is just our, <laughs> our kind of broader fascination that we like to think that, you know, some character in a book is actually sort of, right. you know, the author in disguise, um, which I don't, nobody is, nobody is me in the book. No, no, um, I that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think it, it started out where I was just like, I had this idea. So I, you know, I knew some people would have longer strings, some people would have shorter strings as is, as is life. Um, and I thought the first thing I should do would be to write um, a love story between two people who had strings of very different lengths and how that affects their, their relationship. Um, but, you know, as I was kind of drafting that, I realized that there were just so many other potential people and perspectives that I wanted to explore here. Um, I think the first one that came to mind was, 
you know, how would a, a doctor kind of react in this new world when they're really dealing with life and death so much more intimately than, than the rest of us. Um, and so then I brought in a doctor character and then I thought, okay, so this is a world in which, you know, you can see how long you're going to live. How would that affect people who were you know, knowingly entering a more dangerous, potentially life-threatening career? Um, and so that made me bring in kind of a, two soldier characters um, as well. And then I think the last one I brought in, in addition to this sort of original love story was um, a politician character to really kind of capture the the political side of things that I wanted to, um, you know, to explore. And so what was originally this sort of two character love story grew into now this, you know, eight character um, ensemble. And I think I, I knew going into it that sort of the beauty uh, of this world is that there are as many possible perspectives and reactions and interpretations to this event of these strings arriving as there are human beings on earth. Um, and so I couldn't possibly explore them all. But um, you know, once I felt like I had these eight, I felt like they were sort of different enough. They all make different decisions as to whether or not they look or don't look um, that I felt like that was, that was sufficient and I, and I couldn't add any more or it would have just been a you know 10,000 page book. Um, but then I sort of set about interweaving those characters because that was you know important to me that that somehow their lives did touch in kind of ways both large and small yeah that's great I so I had a I have kind of a unique a pandemic experience also which is that I had a baby in December 2020 wow. um which is uh, yeah which is uh, actually so it's even wilder than just like middle of the pandemic because uh December 2020 babies are basically the first babies that were conceived after the start of the pandemic. So basically in March, 2020, we all had to make the decision that, yeah, we're still gonna go ahead with our plan to have a baby yeah. um, when the world feels incredibly uncertain. Um, wow. Apparently it's the lowest, December, 2020 is like the lowest birth rate in 60 years or something. Oh my gosh, wow. I mean, I believe um, it, yeah, wow. Yeah, it makes total sense. <laughs> um, and so, you know, having been in that headspace of having to think about, you know, the world has gone crazy. Um, it's completely uncertain. Do we go ahead with our plan to have a child? Um, and so I was very interested in your characters that were wrestling with that decision. Um, and I thought that was really smart the way you wove it in. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of just that, what inspired yeah. or why you thought that was important to include that? Yeah, I, it's hard now to remember the order in which all of these thoughts happened. But I, when I knew that I had a sort of characters who were a couple who were, you know, on the path towards getting married and presumably they were thinking about having children after that and, um, you know, how these strings would affect that plan, especially if one of them gets a string that indicates that they won't be present for most of their child's life. Um, to me, that was one of, you know, the, the most intense emotional kind of thought processes that I had to do when I stepped into that character's mindset. Um, and ultimately, and I ended up including kind of two different characters who make different decisions with regards to that one of them decides I actually, you know, don't think I can do this. I can't have this child only to say bye to them so quickly. Um, and another character who decides I, I do still want to do this, you know, any time that I get to spend with this child is, is worth it. And um, I think to me, it was important to show that both of those decisions are, are valid. Um, and a, a lot of my time with this book was showing how, you know, I try not to make judgments in any, any direction. I don't, Think there's a right or wrong decision as to whether or not you should look at your string. Um, I don't think, I mean, there are some characters who obviously make kind of villainous decisions in the book, but mostly I don't think there, it is a little bit more kind of not as morally black and white and, and, um, and sort of no decisions are necessarily right or wrong. They're just right or wrong for the individual. Um, and so that was that kind of question of, you know, do I still get married? Do I still start a family was, um, you know, really a chance for me to explore that from different, from different angles. Yeah, and I mean, without I, without spoiling anything in the end, I, I really loved how no no matter how well thought out these decisions were or how much people plan for it, even while knowing some element of their destiny, you still can't know everything and there no. are still surprises, I think. <laughs> um, that how, like, life will that. always surprise you somehow. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, one literary device that you used that I really liked was um, was the use of letters uh, between two characters, and that's how they end up, you know, connecting. Uh, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your decision to do that, uh, especially as we're in an age of social media and <laughs> tweets and things like that. Why were why was it important to you to use real letters? Um, I'm very bad at social media. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> um, 
hardly ever touch it and um didn't even make Instagram until this book was coming out. And my publisher was like, you should start promoting this book on Instagram. <laughs> um, so, so that was never, I, I sort of grew up in a family where we did, we, we were encouraged to write letters. We did write kind of handwritten letters and that was really special to me and, and my family. Um, but really that was kind of inspired by two specific events in my life. Um, the first was visiting visiting the World War II Museum in New Orleans um, and see where they have a collection of all these letters from, you know, from soldiers. And just being so moved by these, you know, these letters on display and, and feeling like it was, um, you know, someone's such, someone's deepest, private, most intimate thoughts that now I'm reading, like, in a museum, um, just kind of followed my mind. And um, so then I, I used one of those letters that's the inspiration behind this kind of pen pal relationship with these people is one of them thinking about these letters at the, at the museum. Um, and also my trip um, when I was a travel writer, my travels to Italy, which also play into the book. There are some scenes set in Italy um, and specifically going to Verona um, and to Juliet's uh, house there or Juliet's sort of balcony and courtyard um, where people, tourists from all over the world write like write letters to Juliet and leave. fictional character um, and <laughs> kind of expressing their deepest, you know, specifically you're asking, you're usually going there to write a letter to her. People were, you know, out in, out in public kind of putting up notes that were expressing really, you know, some, some very sad sentiments and very happy sentiments kind of about their, their romantic life. Um, and it just kind of really stayed with me that there's something about writing letters that I think makes us a little bit more just honest and and vulnerable and open than we are, um, you know, when we're online. Um, there's something about just kind of the physicality of the letter um, that that just encourages this real this real intimacy. And so I thought um, perhaps I could kind of create a relationship between two people who have never met in person, but yet they have this really intense connection just because of kind of the the medium in which they're writing, which is these these letters. Yeah, that's really lovely. <laughs> Um, so I, you are super young, um, and, and you have this amazing book out now. Did it kind of change the way you have like strings be willing a long, very long life ahead of you? Did you, uh, did, did writing this book, uh, change the way you thought about your life or what you kind of want out of your life? Not that you have to say what it is, but. <laughs> no, it, it definitely did. Um, because I think when I was starting to write it, um, it was just like a passion project. I didn't know if anything was going to happen with it, if anyone other than like my mom was going to read it. Um, <laughs> and so the fact that now it is out in the world and, and many people have connected with it and it's, it's resonated with them um, is just, it's just amazing and still kind of hard for me to, you know, to wrap my head around. Um, but I think because this is a, this is a very you know emotional story. It is a big topic that we all think about whether we not want to or not. Um, you know, I've I've had the privilege of kind of hearing from a lot of readers who who felt like some aspect of the story really resonated with some with a personal experience of theirs and, and they've reached out to me to kind of share their story. Um, it's been such an honor to kind of you know have those experiences with readers and really has just made me feel so strongly that this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. Um, and that that you know this childhood dream of writing a book um now that I've actually seen what it what it actually entails um over the last couple of years um you know it, it it's a very nice feeling to feel like actually that was the right dream it is still it is still the dream it is still what I want to do oh that's great yeah are you working on something else now um I'm I'm kind of in an early brainstorming stage of something else now um and I think kind of using what I learned from this book, which was that I liked, that I thought I'd write only two characters or, and, and I liked this kind of larger ensemble and, and multiple perspectives. Um, I think I'm going to take that to the next book as well and, and kind of do something similar, but um, obviously it will not involve, it's not a sequel. It will not involve strings and boxes. It will be uh, some, something different. <laughs> you will be free from your strings and boxes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, did I read somewhere that it's uh, it's been optioned for a TV program? Um, yes, yeah, that uh, still very early. We'll see what happens, but the TV rights um, were acquired by um, the production company founded by um, President Obama and, and First Lady Michelle Obama, which was um, oh, never, I will never forget that phone call <laughs> in my life. It was, um, 
you know, uh, obviously they, they have an incredible mission and vision for, you know, for their projects. And so I'm just very grateful that something in this story kind of spoke to their company and, um, and we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. That's a wild thing. That's super cool. Uh, would you be in, involved in the adaptation or oh, you don't know yet? Um, right now I've been kind of, you know, talking to their team, but it, it's still kind of still early stages. Um, obviously, you know, I think we wanted to wait until the book came out and sort of saw how, you know, let it have a life first as a book. Um, so we'll see, I would like to be, you know, as, as involved as they would sort of welcome, but I, I fully respect that it's, you know, TV is a totally different medium. Um, and so I'm very open to, you know, to, to many things being changed. That's okay. I'm not, I'm not super precious about it. It already exists in kind of this form. Um, it can exist in a different form and, and take on new directions. Yeah, that's great. So I'm sure everybody asks you this, but would you open your box? <laughs> um, I think I wouldn't right now, um, but I would keep the box. I'm not someone who would throw it away. I would keep it knowing that maybe at a future stage, um, I would like to, to take a look. Um, what about you? Oh, that's a good question. I would love to say that I wouldn't look, but I probably would. Um, I mean, I think I, I, I have a hard time um, with information that I know exists yeah. about that is pertinent to my life. Um, yes. I have a hard time knowing, knowing something exists and not. Uh, Absolutely. Not. Yeah. I'm, I'm very interested in seeing the book is starting to come out in translations um, soon in the next couple of months. Um, and it's already come out in kind of the UK and sort of Commonwealth um, countries, but uh, kind of seeing how the different reactions are in different countries, because I like very anecdotally, it seems like more people in the US have said, no, I would never open my box. And more people in the UK have said, yes, I would open it. And so I haven't yet been able to figure out kind of what that, you know, what the mechanism behind that is, but I'd be interested as it kind of comes in other countries too, to see if there's you know, if there are differences in the ways that sort of our cultures kind of approach this, this topic. Oh, totally. That's so interesting. I never would have thought about that. Um, and I yeah. also don't think I would have thought that Americans would be hesitant to open their box. I know. I think I was a little surprised too. I don't, I don't know what it is. I mean, maybe these are just the people that I have, you know, interacted with that I've seen on Twitter or Instagram or things like that. Um, and so it's not, uh, not a very comprehensive poll. Um, the only the polls that I have seen um, at like kind of larger book clubs or things like that are that um, before reading the book, it's usually about two thirds of the people say I do want to open my box, and then after reading the book, it switches, and about two thirds of the people say I don't want to open my box, which was not my intention in, in writing the book. I was not like trying to have people <laughs> to think one way or another. Yeah, so it's it's been interesting that that kind of has been a bit of a pattern that I've noticed. Yeah, I mean, I think when you asked me that question, I was thinking like, I want to say that I wouldn't because I think that there's something kind of noble about not <laughs> doing it or not opening it. Um, I don't know why I say that, but I think yeah. after reading it, like, I think I would probably live a better life if I didn't, but I also sort of know myself well enough <laughs> to know that temptation is hard to resist, I guess. Um, yeah, definitely. And I think like for me, it was just that hopefully maybe just putting the box on like on your mantelpiece somewhere in your house is this reminder that you see it every morning and you're like, I'm, I'm just going to live a little bit more mindfully today because right, who right. knows what's in there, you know? Um, exactly. And uh, because I feel like it is really like, you know, we are told to kind of live our lives that way, um, you know, live like it could be live like any day could be your last day, but um, I certainly don't do that. Um, I'm not sure, you know, that seems really, really hard. So maybe having this box there is is something that would make it a little bit easier to do. I'm not sure. It's it's all, right. you know, it's every time that I, you know, talk about that question, it it's it's so hard to know. It's so hard to know unless it was actually truly kind of sitting in front of you. Um, although some people have pointed out to me that, you know, we're not so far away from this in the sense that you can take genetic tests, you can do other kind of things that while not giving you, you know, your exact timeline are, are not so far from this concept of kind of having this full knowledge of yourself and your potential lifespan. Um, and so in that sense, even though the book is fiction, there's a little bit of it that feels like maybe someday we could actually live in this world. That's so interesting. I hadn't thought about that at all until you mentioned that, but it is completely true in some senses that there's a lot more kind of way knowledge that you have about yes. your life and about uh things that could be dangerous um yeah 
that you can sort of work with or whatever. But right. yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. And then right now, really the only people who are confronted with that are people who, you know, have have something in their um sort of in something that runs in their family, something that could be hereditary. And they're they're the ones who at the moment are confronted with this question of do I kind of take this test or not? Um, but that perhaps someday in the future kind of, you know, it will apply to all of us. I'm not sure. Right, right, right. Or there's, yeah. you know, and certainly there is way more like prenatal tests that you can yes, sort of learn yeah. more about your baby or whatever. And so, you know, there's obviously lots of ethical questions about that. And then, you know, it could yeah. could kind of continue on. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, although these 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 strings take into account all of it so that they like, we will never be able to take into account kind of, you know, freak accidents or things like that. But uh, in this book, in this world, it had to, it had to be all, it had to be all or nothing. Yeah. For this kind of concept to work. (laughs) Right. Right. And I mean, I guess, so we're about to start the Q and a, but just sort of the final question, did you have any sort of sense in your head of like where the strings came from? I know you never kind of like deal with that in the book (laughs) for obvious reasons, but um, did you, when you were thinking about them, was there sort of like a, and over a governing body that (laughs) strings or anything like that. I mean, I think it was hard not to think of them as coming from just like some sort of entity of fates, just because that was the origin of the idea, sort of the Greek, you know, the Greek mythology. Um, But purposely wanted it to be, to be very open to interpretation. And so, um, you know, I know a lot of readers have said they interpret it as, you know, it, it is an act of God. It is, they are sent by a higher power because, you know, these are people who 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 believe in God. Um, I think other people who don't want that kind of spiritual reading from it, like thinking it's just this like magical fantasy thing that happens. Um, maybe those are people who are more accustomed to reading kind of like fantasy and sci-fi novels. Um, and then I know there are a lot of readers who kind of, as you mentioned, um, they don't really care where it came from. They see this purely as like an allegory for, you know, for other issues in our times. And so the boxes are really just like a metaphor or something like that. Um, and so I, I wanted all of those interpretations to be able to exist within the book. Um, and so that I wasn't forcing any kind of one reading on people. Sure. And as you said, like culturally, it might be received in different countries or different religions or, yes. uh, you know, sort of just depending on where you're coming from, what your belief system is, people can yes. interpret it as they, as they will. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I think we're about to open it up to uh, to audience Q&A, but I just wanted to personally thank you so much for taking the time to chat. It was such a pleasure um, to get to know you a little bit and uh, hear hear a little bit about uh, what went into this uh, this really remarkable book. Thank you. Thank you so much for such um, such really 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 wonderful questions. Um, you're so, you obviously like read the book so thoughtfully, which I which I really appreciate. Um, And uh, let me say also thank you as well. Um, You know, I read, um, I I read the book at a different point in life than Becca did because I have actual teenagers and one who's getting dangerously close to 22. And so, so I, I think one of the characters that really resonated for me was, was the mom character who already has a young adult child. And so when I think of the book, that's, you know, it's, it's not so much what I opened my box, but would I want to know what's in my kid's box? Yeah. Um, but but anyway, thank you for that. It's just such a fantastic book and, uh, you know, a tearjerker. I hope that's not a spoiler, but it is a tearjerker <laughs> and um, just really a f- fantastic read. And I, I really I'm, I'm so glad that I had the chance to read it. Um, so you answered the question about a sequel. You said you're not working on a sequel, <laughs> but could you possibly do a sequel or a prequel? I know prequels are very big right now. That That is true. Um, I think I, I purposely left the ending a little open um, and kind of introduced some new characters in the end who could maybe be followed through um, in a sequel. And so I, I that was that I think that might have been intentional. I, I wrote the ending and then I was like, oh, I guess this kind of does leave the door open for potentially revisiting it. Um, so not at the moment, but maybe maybe in the future. Great. Um, also, people asked um, whether there were plans for a movie or TV series. Um, you did answer that question, um, but then there was sort of a technical, like, how does that process happen for a writer? Sure. Um, so, uh, I, as everyone probably knows, from if you watch movies or TV, there's so many adaptations right now, um, and usually it happens with the writer's agent kind of submitting their their book um, for consideration, or I think just there are scouts out there and like all these film and TV companies have sort of book scouts who are reading books and, you know, looking at obviously bestseller lists and things like that and trying to kind of see what 
what could make for a good adaptation. Um, so there are many different potential um, you know, avenues uh, for it to happen, but there are there are people whose entire jobs are 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 kind of finding books to be adapted. Um, and so a lot of books do get, you know, the rights get acquired and then, you know, I, I'm sure probably probably like 90% of the books whose rights get acquired don't ultimately, you know, mm. become uh, an actual film or TV show. So, you know, fingers crossed for this one, but um, it's, uh, it, you know, if, if you know, nothing happens um, just for it to get optioned is, you know, it, it's a real honor and, and very exciting. Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, having to go through the very emotional process of getting into the head of a character. I assume Mora is the was the character that you're referring to. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you actually do that and whether it has any impacts on your life going forward? Mm. Yeah, I think um, I've always been someone who, who kind of tries to live my life that way, to live with like a sense of kind of empathy and, and feeling like you, you, you never know what someone else is going through. Um, and so writing this book was just kind of taking it to the next level kind of taking that empathy just like even further um and from a very kind of logistical standpoint i i with a book like this which had eight different characters to kind of step into um i i kept them very separate and so you know for any day i would only really try to be in the head space of of mm. one character that day and not kind of jump around and so i felt like i was really sitting kind of in that person's um mm. perspective and you know and so it was just one at a time um but I think to me, you know, what I always loved about reading as a child was that, you know, reading asks you to do the same thing that writing does, which is you open up a book, um, you see a character's name, you obviously know nothing about them. And all of a sudden you're like, I need to sympathize with this person. I need to try to understand them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that to me was like the exciting part of, of reading. Um, and so it's really the same kind of mechanism with writing, um, except you're obviously doing a little bit more of the creating process. Um, but it's why it's why I love books. Um, just the fact that it it really exercises our our muscles in empathy. Mm. Thank you. Um, here's a question that I think um, both of you could answer. Um, it's a little bit of a dark question, but um, <laughs> <laughs> does either of you feel like you have ever received a prophecy of your death? Um, and if so, is it forgettable? Um, how has that impacted your life? Wow. <laughs> Not that I can can think about. I mean, I am someone who who looks for signs from from loved ones that I have lost. Um, who looks for like some sort of sign that they're like still you know still communicating, still here. Um, so that's like a little bit of kind of you know believing in in, in that. But I have not felt like I've seen a sign that, that directly related to kind of to me and my death. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't think I have either, um, but I confess to being like sort of a hyper rational person. Um, <laughs> and so this, actually this issue, the book section in this issue of Columbia Magazine was, we sort of joked that it was the prophecies issue because, um, <laughs> because I was working on the review for Nikki's book. And then also I did an interview with the New Yorker writer, Sam Knight, uh, about his book, The Premonitions Bureau, uh, which is a nonfiction book about, um, a group of a, a psychologist, a psychiatrist in London and a journalist who started this thing called the Premonitions Bureau where they sort of accepted uh, visions from people uh, hmm. in the hopes of averting mass disasters. Uh, it came about in the aftermath of the Aberfan coal mining disaster in Wales. Um, and so while I was reading both of those books, I kept kind of having to check myself and think like, these stories are really remarkable, um, but but then I would sort of look for the science behind it or look for what was the rational explanation for it. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I'm probably someone unlikely to take signs <laughs> in my own life, um, even <laughs> though I I respect the the magic around it for people that do. <laughs> and, and it was fun to kind of read both of them simultaneously. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> so they they study people whose whose premonitions have come true at some point in the past. Yeah, lives. This wow. was, yeah, this was this took place in the '60s, and they there was sort of after this terrible national disaster in Wales, there was a a few people that came forward, sort of having claimed to have visions of this happening, or mm -hmm. one woman woke up choking, thinking something terrible was going to happen, 
And so, uh, so this psychiatrist teamed up with this journalist and they kind of put a call out to the public to ask anybody for kind of visions or foretelling <laughs> or premonitions of, and, and, you know, a very small percentage of them eventually yeah. <laughs> came true. It was like, you know, 3%. And, um, and so eventually kind of shut down. Uh, but the book is really interesting. <laughs> so you might like fascinating. it. Fascinating. <laughs> yeah, fascinating. Yeah. That is fascinating. And wow, what a coincidence that, um, the, it was, it was quite random. The books at the same time. <laughs> we ended up with both of those in the same issue, wow. but kind of made for a fun theme section. <laughs> yeah, really. Wow. Um, uh, another question. Um, so, just going back to the TV show, Nikki. Um, you know, do you have any dream casting? Ooh. Um... I know. It, I know it's hard to believe, but I really don't. Um, I think because because this was my first book, I was writing it, you know, without an agent, without kind of any sense of if this would actually become a book or not. So I really didn't allow myself to like start dreaming. Oh, and this is Meryl Streep right here, you know? Like, um, and so really I, I, I don't have anybody in mind. Um, I don't even really, interestingly enough, when I kind of, I picture the characters in my head, I have like a sort of, you know, vague sense of what they look like, but not really. Like, I think probably other writers maybe write actually with like an image of an actual person in their head, whether it's a, you know, an, an actor or someone they know, but I really kind of, to me, they're, um, they, they could be anybody. Um, and so any, anyone, I think like, it is a very, you know, particular emotional book. So I think any, any actor who kind of related to the emotion behind the book would, would, would do an amazing job. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, there are, certainly plenty of Columbia actors out there. And since- Yes, that would be wonderful, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Obama, so that's another Columbia connection. So <laughs> you know, just keep the whole thing inside uh, inside the university. Yeah, a lot um, of the book is like set and you know, partially written when I was living around, like on, you know, in Morningside Heights on the Upper West Side, kind of around the Columbia campus. Um, and so we could, we could film there too, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, certainly some of my favorite movies have been filmed um, there. <laughs> Um, and then I think the last question just for both of you um, is before we wrap up is just about the, the writing during the pandemic, writing at home, not having people to bounce your thing or ideas off of, um, not having, you know, did, was that more anxiety making? Was it easier to write in a vacuum? Um, hmm. Yeah, I think, I think this was, there was just always going to be anxiety around this for me because it was my first you know, attempt at a book. Um, and so there was just always going to be a lot of self-doubt, a lot of self-criticism, a lot of questioning, you know, is this a practical path? Is this an impossible dream that I'm trying to pursue here? Um, so I don't think that necessarily, you know, writing in quarantine kind of made that any worse or better. Mm -hmm. it, it was always going to be there for me. Um, but I do think, yeah, I think not having, I guess, not having the sort of ability to like go to the library and like chat with other people and you know discuss kind of ideas in that sense was was harder um but I think this this the book always would have been a challenge just writing your first book and probably writing every book after this I, I don't know yet um will be a challenge um yeah Rebecca oh uh yeah I mean my quarantine as I said was sort of broken into two very right. different parts um so <laughs> So pre-baby, um, I I actually concentrate really well at home, um, <laughs> and I kind of like like silence and isolation for working. Although I love my colleagues, um, and you know I I got to do a ton of great reading during quarantine, which yeah. always you know which is which is uh, which is my favorite thing. Um, and then you know post baby everything changed, <laughs> and uh, and. So yeah, um, but I think, you know, it's been interesting to put out the magazine um, first in quarantine and then in hybrid to not be on campus and connected yeah. to people um, mm -hmm. and to not be with our colleagues and so forth. Uh, for sheer writing, I think I do better work uh, work at home, but, uh, but I, you know, I'm happy to be back on campus a little bit now and to be more, more connected to the people mm -hmm. and so forth. Yeah, I hope that the I know there was a huge spike in, in reading, obviously, and people had so much more free time and were at home. So I hope that that continues. Um, that would, you know, that would certainly be amazing. Yeah, it is sort of interesting to think, you know, I, you do always seeing people in coffee shops writing, and you have not had that experience. So 
So would you, <laughs> would you try that the next time? Or are you now just um, never a not coffee shop writer? Yeah, I'm, I'm similar to Rebecca in the sense that I, I like silence. And so I, I would only be in kind of a more communal aspect if I was like still in the kind of talking through the ideas phase. Mm-hmm. Once I'm writing, um, I need total silence. Um, sometimes I'll even put in headphones with like white noise blaring if there's like even my neighbors, <laughs> if my neighbors are even like slightly loud. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very extreme when it comes to the writing process. So um I love chatting about ideas, chatting about books, and then I'm going to go lock myself up and, and do the actual writing. <laughs> um, well, I think, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Becca, and thank you, Nikki, for your conversation. Um, it was just, you know, having read the book, I, I feel like I still, it still like teased out things for me that I hadn't even thought of myself. Um, and um, and also, uh, thank you both for your um your sort of loving explanation of what global thought, the committee of global thought is all about, because it is really, um, you know, a, this very new, very innovative, very dynamic um, uh, master's yeah. program. And so, so happy to, um, to have had, you know, a, a, an alum such as you um, just, you know, from our second class, our second cohort. Um, I just also want to put just a little plug for Columbia Magazine. Columbia Magazine, uh, it comes out three times a year. Um, and then in between there's original digital content. Um, I think my colleagues put in the chat the link to the review. Um, you can also use that link to get into the magazine as a whole. It's the only university publication that reaches alumni of all of Columbia's 17 schools, as well as faculties, mm-hmm. trustees, and donors. It's won 40 national awards for writing, design, and photography. And most recently, the winter 2021-22 issue won the Folio Award for Best Alumni Magazine for the third year in a row. So kudos to you wow. um, and your staff. Um, so- um, I did not get Best Online. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so Nikki, thank you again for being with us today. Becca, thank you very much uh, for your insightful questions. Um, the next Columbia at Home will be on November 9th. So keep an eye out for your alumni newsletters. Um, You can always go to alumni.columbia.edu for information about upcoming events. Um, Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.